uh, I'm going to do that. Okay, so uh, welcome to today's grants and sponsored research initiative seminar hosted by the research program on children and adversity at the Boston College School of Social Work. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Tesla Brigo and I'm the administrative manager for the lab. Uh, the GRIT seminar series was founded as a part of the U19 Youth Forward Implementation Science Hub, funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and their global network of U19 scale-up hubs. Our other partners in this work include the Essence and Shine U19 hubs and the University of Rwanda, Rwanda Center for Mental Health. Before I welcome today's speaker, I'd like to announce that we'll be hosting more GRIT seminars in the spring, including a presentation on February 1st with Dr. Arazio Antanasio and Dr. Sonia Kritikova. And on March 29th, we will host Dr. Pamela Collins, former head of the Global Mental Health Program at MINH. Please visit the RPC website for details on these events and how to register. Also, I'd like to announce that the RPC has openings for two doctoral level positions. So if any of you are interested, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll leave my contact information in the chat. Um, so with that said, I'm pleased to introduce today's GRIT speak speaker, Dr. Eve Puffer. Dr. Puffer is Assistant Professor in Psychology, Neuroscience, and Global Health at Duke University. She specializes in developing and evaluating child and family interventions in low resource settings. Dr. Puffer also focuses on the implementation science and especially community-based models of intervention delivery. She has worked extensively in Kenya and also conducts research on parenting and family-based interventions in humanitarian settings. Today, her talk is entitled Family-Centered and Community-Based Approaches to Global Mental Health, Meeting Children Where They Are. We are so grateful to have you with us today, Eve, and I'll turn it over to you now. Wonderful. Thank you so much all for being here. I'll share my screen and then, oh, just, there we go, and let you all see me as well. So I am very, very happy um, to be here and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all about the ways that my team um, and I work with families and communities um, in, um, in global mental health interventions to reach outcomes for both children and caregivers. So I'll preach to the choir just for a moment. Um, we know that more than three quarters of people with mental health disorders don't receive even minimally adequate treatment. And we know that there's up to a 20% prevalence among young people. It's the leading cause of disability. There's a lack of specialized training for the mental health professionals that we do have. There's a small, but it is growing evidence base for interventions. There's a lack of appropriate treatment settings. The services that we do have are centralized, often in urban areas. And then one thing hopefully we can talk about today is that interventions that are available often still minimize contextual influences. When we think about those um, contextual influences, these are just some of them. And we'll talk today about family as the target of intervention. But I do want us to, to look at this and realize that children are influenced by all of these factors, but so are each um, of the individual family members. So the importance of family was reinforced um, by Black and colleagues um, in 2017 um, developing this nurturing care framework. So the responsive caregiving box is framed a bit more for early childhood development, but really highlights that responsive caregiving and having people to support your emotional development, as well as your physical development, cognitive development, are going to be important um, throughout childhood and adolescence. So if we back up to the most fundamental theory of change of the work that I'll talk about today and um, that of most of us who do family-based work is that if we intervene at the family level, 
we'll see improvements in family functioning. And that can mean a lot of things we can talk about. And that that in turn can play a role in improving child mental health, which I focus on um, most of the time, but also caregiver mental health, which I think is an important advantage to working at the family level. And family-based interventions can of course be prevention and promotion interventions or more on the treatment side. And treatment in this case can mean treating problems that are existing at the family level, which then in turn does serve often as prevention for mental health problems or treating existing mental health problems via a family strategy. And in the real world, often both of these are happening at the same time. So in our research program, we first are aiming to understand how family functioning affects mental health across contexts and across cultures. And then um, all of that in the service of the goal of develop, developing and evaluating contextualized family prevention and treatment interventions. And alongside that to develop implementation models that are relevant and feasible for low resource communities. So in all of the work that I'll share today, we're thinking on both ends of testing the interventions, but testing them from the beginning with, within models that have promise of being sustained, spread, and ultimately scaled. These are some of the intervention trials I've been part of um, that um, Tesla mentioned that I've worked extensively in Kenya and I'll talk mostly about that work today. And then also in Liberia um, with Burmese migrants and refugees in Thailand and also in refugee camps um, on the Somali Ethiopian border. And so happy to talk about these other projects. Um, before I landed at Duke, I was a research advisor at the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, which is also where I had the privilege of working with um, Dr. Betancourt. And so happy to also talk about my time there. For the talk today, I'll focus on the work that I've done in Kenya really over the past many years. Um, on the prevention side, there's an intervention um, entitled READY, which I'll describe to you. And then on the treatment end, Tukopomoja. And then I'll end with our recent work that's really focused on bringing the two levels of intervention together in a community embedded model that we are proposing. So Ready Intervention is a group family strengthening intervention really focused on prevention and promotion. Tuko Pomoja is a family counseling intervention to treat current family distress. So the treatment here is identifying that family distress as the primary target. Ready was conducted in Mahuru Bay, Kenya, which is right on the shores of Lake Victoria. And it stands for, a, again, a very long acronym, Resilience, Education, and Skill Development for Youth and Families. Our goal in this project um, was to understand risk factors for poor adolescent outcomes, and in this case, including HIV risk. And then to develop a community-based approach to promote well-being and then to reduce this HIV risk. This is a very high um, HIV prevalence area of Kenya. So we started, as most of my studies do, with formative work. And this was a mixed methods formative study where we did a quantitative survey with youth and caregiver dyads, as well as qualitative interviews and focus groups with youth caregivers, community leaders, religious leaders, people at all levels of influence um, on youth's lives. After combining this mixed methods data, this is um, one of the simplified models of risks that came out of that work. So I just want to highlight that you'll see the lack of basic needs and education and cultural and religious norms have arrows um, to all of the other boxes. And this was really the con contextualization piece um, that we wanted to learn about. At the adolescent level, we found emotional and behavioral problems um, described that were also associated with sexual risk behavior. Um, and at the family level, one of the strongest themes was that communication difficulties in a family and including things like mixed messages about sex 
that were related more directly to HIV risk behavior were present in families um, and also present at the larger community level with adolescents getting mixed messages um, from community leaders and the places they were spending time as well. So from that work that we also conducted with this community advisory committee, um, we worked with the 20 member community advisory committee to actually develop the intervention. And this included um, people at from all different sectors of the community, education, health, anyone working in an HIV related program, um, and those involved with youth activities. Our approach um, followed a lot of the community based participatory research methods, but we also um, made sure to bring in the synthesis of the academic literature into our community advisory committee meetings so that they were fully aware of what the evidence base was, as well as the local results. So while we brought more of that expertise, all of the material was in front of the committee and us. And that really facilitated an interesting process um, of making collaborative decisions on the intervention and the ways in which um, the intervention was implemented. So I'll start with the implementation model. The ready implementation model really centered on task shifting, but within established social support systems. So it was a universal prevention intervention using community-based lay providers. The committee also identified churches as the most promising implementation setting within a community with very little infrastructure. In our survey, over 90% identified with a specific church it's one of the only places that families attend together, both genders and both parents and, and kids. And the church is widely accepted as a trusted place to seek support. It was also a group format with all family members attending together. And you can see this a picture of one of the interventions happening here. So when we developed the intervention, our goal was to take an evidence-based framework with these evidence-based strategies um, and then have very culturally anchored material inserted into that to develop a contextualized intervention. To do this, we held intervention development workshops um, and that included our advisory committee members who served as leaders in this process, as well as youth and caregivers from the community. You can see here, I'm creating some intervention materials to go along with the metaphors that they developed. The resulting intervention is a nine session intervention, two hours each. And you'll see that the overarching um, focus of all of the sessions is training in family communication skills. But these communication skills are then applied to the top stressors and top priority issues that we identified, economic communication, so directly talking about finances within the family and conflict related to that, emotional support, and then um, HIV prevention, learning about HIV and sexuality together as a family. To teach family communication, a hallmark of this approach is having family members together actually practicing the communication exercises in the moment with coaching by the facilitators, rather than a skills model where only some members of the family learn it, like caregivers and are then asked to apply it only outside of a session. And this is one of the youth support groups. So we conducted a stepped wedge trial with 124 households. Um, and in this trial, we rolled out the intervention to four um, churches. And our primary outcome was of course, family communication. And we tried to look at every angle of communication in families and to get caregivers reports and youth reports. And we were encouraged to see positive effects across most of these domains. And from this study, we did conclude that this intervention does seem to improve family communication in a very low resource context. We did not find any short-term effects on mental health. 
At baseline, few of the youth um, endorse significant levels of mental health symptoms. So we weren't able to see this in this non-clinical population. So of course that might mean that this intervention is not powerful enough to target mental health, or it could mean um, that with longer term follow-up, we would see the preventative effects, which is what we hope to be able to do in the future. On the implementation side, the participatory development process went well and was acceptable to those involved. Um, it resulted in deep adaptation for culture and context, um, which was also acceptable. And the whole family approach and lay provider delivery did prove to be feasible um, for this intervention in this setting. And one um, of the successes of this project that has, has influenced the rest of my work um, is that working in these social settings was feasible and acceptable. Um, and was in, our intervention was able to work into their existing um, routines. A remaining gap that we was very clear to us is that families who were ex experiencing higher levels of current distress that needed individualized support were not adequately served by the ready intervention. And in this um, context, and in most um, low resource contexts, there aren't a lot of family level referrals that, that we could make. And so we felt like it was a gap that we needed um, to fill. And that's what led to the Tuco Pomoja study, which means we are together in Kiswahili. And with the Tuco Pomoja project, our goals were to develop a family therapy intervention. So more on this treatment side for highly distressed families, often who included a child or adolescent with emotional or behavioral concerns. And then um, alongside, again, to develop a feasible community-based implementation model that also used task sharing. So we again started with formative work, in this case, a qualitative study, and the purpose being to target family processes, um, to identify family processes that we wanted to target in the intervention, and then existing local responses. How were people in the community already trying to solve these problems? The second <clears throat> procedure was to match those needs we identified with existing models of family therapy to see where the closest match was already to needs and how people were already addressing those. And once we had done that, we simplified strategies in a way that we thought would be feasible for lay providers to deliver, manualized that, and then worked to identify natural counselors in their communities. Again, the people who were already trying to address these problems with other families. And lastly, we developed a mobile phone application to support the delivery, data collection, and supervision. This was in place from the first pilot that I will talk about, and since then, we've developed a system using this application for asynchronous um, supervision that I'm happy to talk with others about um, later as well. So the resulting in, in intervention model draws heavily from solution-focused family therapy and also from parenting skills training strategies and behavioral coping strategies. So a family comes into the intervention and completes a program orientation and a family assessment. This is done individually with a counselor, usually in homes. And then the intervention is modular from that point. And so that means that the counselor and the family together can collaboratively decide which of these modules they would like to start with based on their most pressing needs or what they would just like to work on first. This could be the dyadic relationships, which would be the parent, adolescent, and marital relationship modules, a whole family, family organization, family relationship module, or a um, module specific to caregiver and child distress in cases where mental health problems um, needed to be addressed either before or alongside um, the family work. And after a family has finished one of these modules, they then circle back to the assessment phase and um, decide whether they are going to continue with another module or graduate from the program. Throughout the Ready and the Tuco Pomoja um, interventions, the family is symbolized as a tree um, with the trunk being um, the partner relationship if, they're, um, 
if it is a two caregiver family, the leaves are the children and the roots are the community supports. The way that a modular intervention like this was made feasible in this case was to have 10 core steps that span across all of those modules. And then within those, um, there's content specific to the relationship that they're working on. So you can see this goes from a systems-based assessment of the family problems um, through um, communicating about thoughts and feelings, identifying what they've tried to do before in steps four and five, moving to the miracle question, which in solution-focused family therapy is really about helping the family to envision what their ideal family would look like. And then when they set goals and action plans, it is to work closer and closer to that um, miracle family um, that they envisioned um, in this step of the intervention. And then there's tracking progress and supporting change. This is not a time limited intervention, but you work with the family until they and um, the counselor feel that they have achieved um, their goals. So in one of the pilot studies, um, this was funded by the Grand Challenges Canada. We had six lay counselors who were the natural counselors we identified from the community, um, a, a relatively brief training. Um, the counselors enrolled nine families and there was a tiered supervision model similar to the apprenticeship models that you're likely familiar with. We had students in this case um, who were undergraduate students in medical psychology meeting directly with the lay counselors um, in person or over the phone. They then had weekly supervision with a Kenyan psychologist um, Professor David Ayuku, who is pictured here, who's the co-PI, and then weekly Skype consultation with the US-based psychologists and doctoral students. And that first case was also seen as more of a continuation of their training. We um, measured our outcomes for both the clinical changes um, that we might see, as well as several of the implementation outcomes um, that we were really focused on, on set in such a small trial. We analyzed each of the therapy session transcripts in order to look at things like clinical competency, treatment fidelity, um, and then your basic engagement um, um, outcomes as well. So this is a pre-post small study. So what we were looking for here is a signal of change in the right direction, complemented with qualitative results that also supported these. So if you'll look um, at both the adolescent report on the left and the caregiver report on the right, we saw change in the hoped for direction across overall family functioning, child maltreatment, marital violence, um, mental health symptoms um, for the children and for the caregivers. So we were very encouraged by these results in terms of it warranting um, further study. And this was corroborated by the qualitative um, um, interviews as well. So what's nice about a small sample is you can look at plots of individual families. Um, so I'll just show you quickly a few of these. You'll see um, hope, belonging, and family functioning here. Um, and we are able to dig into um, some of these red lines, which means not um, in the expected direction. And then here, um, youth parent communication, MCG is fathers, male caregiver, FCG is mothers. And then um, these are measures of behavioral problems from the youth self-report. We were happy to see decreases um, in those problems as well. In terms of process implementation outcomes, um, we had close to 90% um, fidelity um, completion of the intervention and the ENACT scores measuring clinical competency fell in the moderate range, which we were happy with given that it was their first um, therapy cases. Um, and then for the facilitators, the families um, did enjoy having familiar counselors. They appreciated the trust and continuity and shared many fewer confidentiality concerns than we were um, concerned about. And then um, the flexibility for family specific priorities was valued by both the families and the counselors who were eager to address the main problems that the families presented with. We had barriers um, 
several barriers, one of which was unpredictable work demands with caregivers, especially fathers, working outside of the community and caregiver substance use, often among fathers as well. And so um, I also had a student follow up with a father's level intervention that I'm happy to, to talk with if folks are interested. So we were um, glad to find that lay counselors were able to deliver these more complex family therapy strategies, which really push sort of the edges of task shifting um, that's been, been done before for family level interventions. Um, and the counselors embedded in communities um, were acceptable. And the pilot suggested those multi-level benefits um, that encouraged us um, to embark on future study. The gaps here, um, when we talked with our counselors especially, was that prevention was needed. And in this case, we had only provided the treatment. And so counselors were asking for wider access to skills building material. And when counselors were referring families, we were finding that Tuka Pomoja really was too intense for some of the referred families, though they were experiencing um, distress, not to the level of needing individual family counseling. So this led us to think about how we might integrate Ready and Tuka Pomoja together in an intervention package. So we wanted to integrate them beyond just providing them in the same community side by side. And as we thought about the systematic ways to do this, we wanted to take a step back and, and determine whether we might develop an implementation approach that would be applicable to other multi-level interventions, also in very low infrastructure and low resource communities. So we started with the lessons learned I've just described from the two evaluations. And then we looked at those, of course, in the broader implementation science literature. There are, there's a great toolbox of empirically supported um, strategies for disseminating mental health treatments in low resource places. So luckily we don't need to recreate the wheel anymore, but we asked ourselves, how can we integrate what we've learned with the empirically supported strategies to provide perhaps a new um, alternative approach. So we're proposing the community embedded model, which is an integrated implementation model combining existing strategies to pr promote sustainment and spread or dissemination in low resource communities that are designed to apply across interventions and across contexts. So there are five key components um, to this model. One is that it is delivered within an existing social setting in a community. Second is that the intervention strategies span a continuum of needs, so often prevention and treatment. The third is lay, using lay providers, so um, really drawing on the extensive task shifting literature. Multi-problem or modular interventions, which have been used very successfully in individual level treatments. Um, and then a fifth link to advanced care, whatever that might mean in a given context. The rationale for looking um, across these components um, and putting them together into a model is that we wanted an organized framework to work within what is already working in communities. So that's the overarching guiding principle. The assumptions are, um, that I think are supported by many of our experiences, is that communities usually have functioning social settings and people who are already supporting psychosocial needs. There are established local systems of helping that hopefully we can support with integrating evidence-based mental health interventions into what's already happening. And then embedding in those existing routines can promote uptake, sustainment, and spread, um, per perhaps being an alternative to creating um, a parallel system or um, potentially working within systems that are overburdened. So this is um, the model put together. I will break it, break down the components in a moment. But one of the hallmarks, of course, is that this social setting is within a community already existing and that those tiers of treatment the prevention and the treatment, tiers of intervention, the prevention and treatment are both housed within that social setting. 
and that the prevention piece is often group based reaching a larger number of people within that social setting with the goals of improving the well being of all the participants, as we focused on in ready. Also creating a more supportive environment within that setting and um, decreasing help seeking stigma by normalizing, for example, in our intervention, the presence of family distress and family problems and the needs to improve in those areas. That then facilitates screening and referral within the same setting to a treatment or more intensive level of intervention, in this case, Tuco Pomoja, that's multi-problem so that still within this same um, flow of interventions, families or individuals are able to have multiple potential problems addressed. The outcomes, of course, um, are clinical change. And across both of these, they're delivered by lay providers, sometimes the same lay providers and sometimes different, but lay providers drawn from within that setting. And then, of course, our link um, to formal care for the highest need cases. So I'll talk about each component um, briefly. The social setting that you might be considering when you have an intervention is any place where members of a social group regularly come together in ways that foster personal and lasting relationships. Religious congregations is, of course, um, the ones that were involved in our work, but this could be sports teams or recreation groups, even school groups. Um, there are a wide variety that are going to be more or less relevant in any context. And beyond asking yourselves, where, where are the social settings that are well attended by the target population, which is often where we've stopped, um, we took a step and said, what is it that we are looking for in social settings that might predict success? Um, which are also empirical questions that we can ask from this model. But our four proposed domains of fit are fit with the perceived needs of the social group. Do people within the social group think that they need um, the intervention that's being offered? The second, which I think is very important, is fit with mission and values. And this is nicely described in implementation science as values innovation fit. If your intervention achieves the goals that it sets out to achieve, will that also push the mission and values of that setting forward? The third is fit with activities and operations. So are there already scheduled activities in place and the infrastructure to support the types of activities involved in the intervention itself? And then fourth, looking ahead for capacity for sustainment and scale up, either within the specific setting where you're delivering, or does that setting have um, connections with larger bodies that might be able to support spread and ultimate scale up. For example, religious congregations having connections at the denomination level or um, schools having connection with the larger school administrative bodies. And then the two tiers nested within this social setting addresses the continuum of needs. And I explained this a bit before that the prevention and promotion is that group level benefit. And then the treatment um, provides the more intensive care. The two um, things I haven't mentioned yet is that if the content of the two types of interventions is synergized and there is consistency across, for example, the language used or the skills taught, then the treatment can more cohesively build on those prevention skills. And as a family or an individual with these higher levels of needs is going through the treatment process and eventually graduates from that treatment process, they are still operating within this social setting that hopefully is now more supportive, understanding. They themselves have the skills that um, the family is trying to apply. And so I think of that a little bit as a safety net, a supportive net for the members in the treatment component of the intervention. For lay providers, um, the unique um, part in the community embedded model is that these are the natural counselors that I've described before. And here we're looking for ways to ask ourselves, what are the natural counselors already doing? What do they want to support their existing roles? And how can we 
fit into that. So in, for an example in Tuco Pomoja, there's, um, there's that culture of meeting individually, individually with families to talk about problems. But of course, that's a low number of families for any, any individual counselor. And so in order to truly stay within those routines, um, the caseload would have to remain low. If we wanted to increase that, then that adds to implementation burden and requires a different set of um, strategies. Multi-problem treatment, this is efficient and flexible. The lay providers are not going to have the luxury of learning or delivering or referring to specialized services for each individual problem. Streamlines their training. And as we saw here, it's most often applied to individual treatment, but could also be applied to family or group level interventions. And the final um, component is this link to formal care. We all want to make sure that as much as possible, we have referral systems set up for the highest need cases. In this model, we've thought about integrating efforts more within prevention and treatment to actively involve um, the formal care setting, settings or representatives to build familiar and comfortable relationships between the social setting, the lay providers and the formal care providers so that we can facilitate a more comfortable, familiar, effective referral and follow-up process for these higher need cases. We know that sometimes it's difficult um, to make those referrals really happen. And often they are in systems that is much more um, intimidating um, for all of us, I think. So if we can really focus on building those positive relationships closer to the beginning of the process, um, we believe that that will make the ultimate outcome more effective. So our next steps um, are to evaluate the full community embedded model with our intervention approaches, which is underway now, um, or paused um, for COVID, but um, we are in the middle of that um, study. And then um, to test applicability for other contexts and interventions. And this is where I would love thoughts and questions um, now and later about um, how you see this potentially fitting into your own work or not. Um, and then using this framework to unpack mechanisms, to ask questions like, how do changes at the social setting level, how do changes at the group level um, from the prevention tier potentially influence individual and family level change? And we can ask those questions empirically um, and support that um, the organization of those questions um, through this framework. So I will stop there um, and thank my main collaborators on this project. David Ayuku is professor at Moy University, is co-PI on all of the Tuco Pomoja work, um, and then the funders, um, and also the programs that we work, have worked with very closely in order to implement um, these projects. So I'd love now to open it up um, for questions um, and discussion. Great, thank you, Eve. Uh, we've actually received a, a handful of questions in the chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and just uh, read those for you. Um, so the first one is what measure was used for belonging? Oh, that was, um, that's a, a great question. Those were locally generated items um, from our formative qualitative work. Great, thank you. Um, next question, uh, what family functioning measure was used and how was it adapted to Kenya? So that is also um, locally developed items and we're in the process of publishing a validity study on the measure, um, part of which was used in this study and um, calling it the family togetherness scale. Um, and that was drawn from a study where we um, trained lay interviewers um, to conduct what we what approximates to a clinical interview with families to identify their well being in terms of their family structure and organization, the emotional support um, within a family and their communication and problem solving skills. Um, and so we um, had them assigned um, scores that are drawn from the general assessment of relationship functioning, which 
has been part of the DSM, um, not used very often, and then um, uh, administered a very large battery of family um, items that were related to family functioning that were locally derived from the qualitative data. And administering all of those and then analyzing which of those items best predicted the scores that were generated from those qualitative interviews. So approximating a gold standard um, that we might um, be lucky enough to have here with a depression clinical interview um, compared with a brief scale. So we have a 30 item measure um, and happy to share that. Um, and a subset of those items were used in this study um, prior to the validation work. Great, thank you, Eve. Um, next question, how did you decide to use lay counselors rather than licensed counselors? Um, the, that decision is really driven by the human resource gap um, at, as a first level, there are very few um, licensed counselors um, and especially accessible to the communities, um, accessible and accessible to the communities in which we work. That said, I think there is a middle ground, especially in Kenya and in communities like Eldoret, where small counseling programs, whether or not they're in universities or not, and counseling certifications, are more and more common. And some of the lay providers had goals of pursuing those. And I think we could do a better job of trying to integrate with those counseling programs as well. Um, so for example, the student supports and their undergraduate students in a large university, we created a course or a practicum course that um, allowed them to receive credit, for example, for the supervision they um, provided to the local counselors. The model is that new students will come in, they need to be trained again, um, and that's just part of the model because we're training new students each time in family therapy. But I think that that could be done also for others in counseling programs that might be limited in resources, limited in any training in child and family work. So I do think we need to do a better job at looking at the middle between community-based lay counselors and um, professional mental health professionals and see how we can integrate um, counselors, um, people with very short degrees in counseling as local supervisors, um, for example, even if we want to use the natural counselors to be often in direct contact with the individuals and the families. Great. Um, next question. Um, are there plans to adapt an integrated model to post-conflict settings? And if so, how, uh, how are assumptions about community stability and social support changed or not? Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I continue to work with the International Rescue Committee, and we've talked about this a bit because the trials that um, I've been involved in, um, um, one large one with um, Dr. Betancourt, um, it focuses on the promotion and the prevention um, aspect. And so we're getting stronger and stronger evidence and the IRC has done an amazing job of disseminating and adapting those strategies across contexts. But they are identifying some of these same gaps of needing more intensive intervention. Um, for some children and for some families. So we're at the beginning of discussions about this integrated model. I do think we will have a different, we'll certainly have a different set of social settings from which to choose. And some of those will have to shift our thinking from something like a religious congregation or a school that we have no reason to expect will dissolve over time and recognize the potential temporary nature of the social structures that we identify. So it will be a very interesting process and I think very so much um, across post-conflict settings, depending for example on um, how long the conflict has lasted and how established um, relationships and life is in a, a refugee camp that's been um, in existence for a long time versus um, more transient. Um, situations. So in some cases, I can imagine it looking quite similar. Um, 
and in others very, very different where parts of this might not work might not work as well and you would need to shift who the providers are and how to um, implement social support in a meaningful way depending on the stability of that social setting. Thank you. Um, I think we can probably do a few more questions. Um, I see a question about um, how do you determine the perceived uh, pair participants perceived needs of the intervention? How do you use this data for your implementation? And is it a part of the inclusion or exclusion criteria? These are in the chat. I might stop sharing. Um, yes. The, the multi-part questions might be easier for me. Yeah, this question is from Carolyn Schaefer. It's in the chat. Okay, great. I'm having trouble stopping sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. So if people can ask their question if it makes it more fun. Hi, Eve. It's Teresa. Sorry to join late. Great to see. You. Okay. Now I'm nice to see you. Great. Um, and either way is fun. Oh, it's nice to see some of your faces. <laughs> um see in the chat. What is happening? All right. Um, Tesla or whoever asked that question, can you ask it one more time while I Carolyn, do you want to ask yeah. your question? Sure. Um, I was wondering how you determine the participants' perceived needs of the intervention, and then how, if you use this data as part of the inclusion exclusion criteria. Gotcha. So the perceived needs that um, I was referring to specifically in that model is at the organization level. So oh, okay. Really talking with the leaders of those organizations before you enter into an agreement to deliver the intervention in that setting. And so a lot of times that starts with a surface level understanding of what it is that we do and the range of needs that we can meet, but then asking what are the needs of the families in their, um, in their specific setting and asking them what do they see their role in and meeting those needs. Uh, and then we use that in a way to figure out which social setting is going to be the best fit. Um, the, Perceived needs of the participants is also part of the assessment process um, in a lot of education about the range of needs that we can meet and the range of needs that they have. And sometimes that assessment does lead to the end of a conversation of, you know, I don't think there's a great fit here. Um, and then by being part of a social setting and all my examples are church settings. Um, often there are other services within that same social setting that might be a better fit. So for example, if a counselor, a lay counselor refers a family who seems to be having a lot of trouble, we might um, assess them and find that their relationships and problem solving are actually quite strong, but it's just a sheer lack of resources um, that's standing in their way and causing stress. And in that case, we might, um, refer them to other people in the church setting who are really working on things like school fees or um, other services like that that they've already set up to support economic needs of the families in the church. Thank you. Eve, can I jump in? I know Tessa's got, maybe Tessa, you can queue up some other questions or condense them, but I wanted to go back to the conflict affected settings um, discussion because you and I both have had a lovely long-term relationship with IRC um, and one of the challenges we face too if you shift to a social setting that's temporary because of a refugee camp environment then we're always in that same old dynamic of how to then we build back better um, strengthen systems come out of the conflict period with something more sustainable rather than these ephemeral beautiful models that then don't translate to services for trauma affected populations, which we all know are going to be needed over the long haul. Do you have any thoughts on how to get something more embedded and sustainable um, out of a, a conflict response, um, given all the amazing experience you've had? Yeah, actually, um, the first example that comes to mind, Teresa, is from our Happy Families Project, which was a um, family strengthening program that we worked on with Burmese migrant families who were mostly living in Thailand. And the intervention model was to pair a facilitator who was working for the IRC 
with someone in the community. And so they were trained. Um, and then it was a bit of a um, ongoing training model because while the people um, from the IRC did not have any specialized mental health training, so they were lay in a way as well. Um, they were also able to provide ongoing support to this community member. But I can imagine after that support is removed, now you have people within local communities and we're talking very local communities. So these are communities who are at risk um, in terms of even legal concerns. And so they're very, very local. And I can imagine that given um, some resources and way less than the IRC would need, for example, to implement that program, they would then be equipped to do that. And I really, I do think that we could push the envelope a little bit on the level of intervention. I think some of your work has done this too, Teresa, that lay providers at the very local community level can do. And if everything that we did from, uh, if most things that we did at an NGO level in these situations imagined what it would look like after that support is removed, and we identified the natural counselors and at least paired them. So a lot of you know, what we see as natural counselors are going to be in very stressful situations themselves. So there's a balance between overburdening them and saying, we aren't going to provide any staff support. We're not going to provide these things because it's not sustainable. I don't think that's um, the best choice, but involving them um, and pairing them in this way and then preparing for that sustainment, I think is often possible. And I would say just one more thing on this, the, even when it's a protracted conflict and um, an INGO is able to provide these services, even if that organization is still there, they're not able often to keep providing these programs, even though they are present. Um, and so that sustainment could happen, even with the ongoing but very light touch support of the NGOs, for example. So you could still, you it could be a gradual process. And you could actually still be there to measure the sustainment and sort of provide a safety net if it if it didn't work and needed to be problem solved. Yeah, great answer. And it's about sort of envisioning that from the beginning when you come in with the emergency response, having the intention, intentionality to think about something more sustainable in addition to responding to immediate needs. Right. So anyone who's willing to actually ask their question gets the privilege of asking the last question. So of those of you who put them in the chat, would someone like to unmute and jump in? Sarah, for you. <laughs> I was wondering, um, I'm really interested in your process of developing those measures using qualitative data. And I wanted to learn more about it. So I was wondering if you've published any articles that describes that. Yeah, we have one under review right now about that family functioning measure. And often we have gone through the um, simpler process, which I think is also um, quite effective of doing a qualitative study, the developing some items based on that or looking at the domains that are reported, looking at matching up whether there are existing measures that do that well or well enough. Um, and then sometimes adding a few of those local items onto the end of that. And I imagine several of you have have done that as well. Um, for this family functioning, we found quite a few shortcomings in the content of the family functioning measures, but so much in the language of the family functioning measures went, that when we started to translate them, it just became a totally different question. Um, so then when we looked at the scoring, um, that started to make a little less sense too. This is one of the few um, times when we have really started more from the ground up. Um, so it was an intensive process, but I think an assumption in measures development sometimes, and I've certainly had this um, thought, this perspective before as well, is that we can't do these gold standards of like a gold standard clinical interview, for example. People have done it to different levels, but I do think, again, pushing the envelope a little bit onto lay providers, to lay research team members, I think can be taught to do some of these more in-depth interviews that can then be used to compare against a quantitative um, measure. And that we, can, we can't we can do that on a huge validity study scale with 
hundreds of people. So you're going to be limited in your psychometrics and have to be a little more creative. But I do think we're missing some opportunities by sort of skipping the step of the, and I use clinical interview loosely because this was family functioning, but skipping that step where we actually could find out what is happening with these families. And then when they answer these items, does it reflect what is actually happening with these families? Um, so we chose that instead of a larger sample um, where we would have um, some of the psychometric data that would require you know, a larger sample. Amazing work, Eve. Maybe you would um, help us distribute your science and send around some papers. We'll distribute them to the group. I think there's a lot of interest and excitement about what you're doing. It, it's really impressive work and um, it's really been fun to collaborate with you over the years and see you know, where you're at in this moment and contributing, especially to an implementation science perspective on doing this really high quality work. It's not just the does it work, but then how can we embed it, sustain it, strengthen systems of care for populations that deserve our best work. So we just all wanna thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to see you.